Chapter 3. Darkness seeps into every crack and corner of this Detroit. Even with a few lampposts dotting the streets, I can see the breadth and depth of this city that is my birthplace, that is now my home. I squint to see if the big mansions I've seen on American TV will glow or sparkle in the dark. I hope to catch a glimpse of the very tops of the tall buildings, but the car is moving too fast, with its fancy seats, too loud music, and the scent of shiny new things. Chantal sits so close to the steering wheel, her small body enveloped by the leather seat, her hands steady. Donna sits in the passenger seat, and she keeps checking her reflection in the rearview mirror, the sun visor mirror, and her phone. She pulls out a big brush from her bag and brushes the ends of her long hair. Pree is next to me in the back and turns on her phone to stare at the screen. Everything is quiet, tense, until Chantal changes the music and turns the volume up really loud. The car sways a little because Pree starts to dance as she says, Aw, shit, yo, turn that shit up some more, Chant. The bass reaches my insides, but it's not enough to shake the thought of my mother from my mind. I lean my forehead against the backseat window and try to see past the speeding dark and into this new world called Detroit. I try to take it all in, even the heavy music, so I can save every bit for my mother. I remind myself to smile because I, because finally I am here on this side of the good life. We pull in onto a smaller street and park at the corner. Chantal turns the music off and the car is still. I stare out the window. There are no mansions or big buildings here. The small houses are so close together, they might as well be holding hands. Donna helps me out of the car. Welcome home, Fabiola, she sings. The front door to a small white house swings open. There are a few steps and a narrow porch leading up to that door. I want nothing more than to rush in to let the house's, house's warmth wrap around my cold body. A dimly lit lamp shines a light on the person standing at the door and I recognize the face. It's like Maman's, but rounder and thicker. They have the same deep set eyes, the same thick eyebrows that will never go away, no matter how many times they wax or pluck them. But she doesn't smile like my mother always does. Half her face barely moves, frozen from her stroke. Maman was supposed to be here taking care of that face. She is fatter than Maman, but her clothes are smaller and tighter and shorter. Wait till my mother sees her big sister dressed like a teenager at a sweet Mickey concert. Oh, Matanjo last saw me in person when I was a tiny baby, and since then only through Facebook photos. My aunt comes toward me, arms extended wide. She hugs me tight, and I breathe in her smell. My mother has been the only family I've known my whole life, and here in my aunt's arms, my world feels bigger, warmer. When Matant Joe lets go, she says, Valerie was supposed to be here, so what happened, eh? I recognize her deep voice from all those long-distance phone calls with a 313 number. Maman said that Matant Joe used to have the sweetest birdsong voice, so sweet that she could make a man fall in love with her just by offering him a glass of water. Matant, they said they are detaining her, I say. They're sending her to New Jersey. They're not going to let her in, Chantal adds as she takes off her boots by the door. But she's already in, Donna says. She sits on the arm of the living room couch and slides off her coat. Why would they send her to a whole other state just to send her back to Haiti, Ma? Yeah, Ma, that's fucked up. Pre drags my bags to the bottom of the stairs, then lifts one onto the first few steps. So trying to come to America from the wrong country is a crime? My aunt looks at my four big suitcases and her face falls. Then she inhales deep and only one shoulder raises up to meet her breath. She shakes her head as if she's already given up. I will try, but she starts to say, these things, Fabiola, they are so complicated, yes? Matan Jo, nap juen yon fasson, I say in Creole. We will find a way. English, please, she stops to stare at me. I hope your mother really sent you to that English speaking school I paid all that money for. Yes, and I had one more year to graduate. Thank you. Good. Leave your mother to me. In the meantime, you will finish your junior year with Pri and Donna, okay? She says. A bit of Haiti is peppered in her English words. The accent has not completely disappeared. We, oui, ma tante. English, she yells, and I jump. Yes, aunt. Pri laughs while coming back down the stairs. Ma, don't be so hard on her. You finally got the little good girl you prayed for. She looks like she's on the straight and narrow. I thought I was your good girl, Chantal whines. You? Matan Joe laughs. You are my only hope. You think it was my dream for you to end up at community college? All those good grades? 
That big SAT score and Wayne County Community College is all you have to show for it? Here we go again, Pre mumbles as she comes to stand next to me. Chantal sighs. Who would have been driving you around, Ma, if I went away to college? Who would have been looking out for Pre and Donna if I left, she says. Chantal looks smaller without her coat. Her frame is more like mine with her broad chest and thin legs. Everything she said sounds like she has a good head on her shoulders. I decide then and there that we will be the second set of twins in this family. I will pay attention to what she does and how she talks. She smiles when she sees me staring at her. Matan Joe sucks her teeth sucks her teeth long and hard. She pulls me toward her and removes Chantal's scarf from around my shoulders. Don't concern yourself with my crazy daughters. Come on, girl, you must be hungry. We, oui, Matant, I say again, but try to swallow my words. It's habit. She's never said anything to me over the phone about speaking only in English. You are going to have to pay me each time you speak a word of Creole in this house. Yes, Matant. Aunt Jo, say it just like that. Let the words slide out and don't be so uptight about it. It's just English, not too complicated. I follow her into the kitchen as my cousins settle on the couches and someone turns on the big TV. The living room of this house, my new home, is a sea of beige leather. The furniture crowds the small space as if every inch of it is meant for setting, sitting. I've seen bigger salons in the mansions atop the hills of Pichonville, even fancier furniture and wider flat screen TVs. But none of that belonged to me and my mother. None of the owners were family. Here, I can sit on the leather couches for as long as I want and watch all the movies in the world as if I'm at the cinema. My aunt uses a cane to get from the living room to a narrow archway leading to the kitchen. The cabinets are a nice cherry red color. The refrigerator and stove are a shiny sliver, silver, like the moonlight. The green numbers on the stove say it's now 1030 at night. Matan Joe opens a cabinet, pulls out several small bottles of pills, puts them into the pocket of her short dress. The left side of her body droops and her dress slides off her shoulder. Are you feeling okay, aunt? I ask, making my voice as small as the eye of a needle. She sighs and tries her best to stand upright. Here they call it a stroke, but your mother would have said that the gay day were pulling me into Guinan. Death owns half of me, Fabiola. Don't say that, Matant. I mean aunt. It's true. I'm sure your mother has taught you some things over the years, right? So here is the fridge, the stove, some pots and pans. Make yourself at home. This is the house your Uncle Philip bought with his hard-earned money. This is the house your cousins were raised in, and now I'm so happy to share it with you. She doesn't smile when she says this, and her words are as dry as cassava bread. Those words were meant for my mother, not for me. I pull out a seat from the table, but my aunt doesn't join me. She yawns, scratches her head, rubs her left shoulder, rolls her neck, and disappears into another room right next to the kitchen. I wait for her to come back, but she doesn't. My cousins are laughing and talking among themselves in the living room. Again, there is loud music, but it comes from the TV. I don't want to be a burden to them, but I have no idea what to do in this kitchen. Suddenly, I feel so alone in this house. I am surrounded by family, but none of them really knows me or understands what happened to me today. My heart begins to ache for my mother. How could my aunt just leave me here in the kitchen? Is this how you treat family in America? There is no celebration for my arrival. No meal is cooked. No neighbors are invited to welcome me. Not even a glass of cool water is on the table for me to drink after such a long trip. If my mother were here, she would quickly start gathering ingredients to make me a meal, to make everyone a meal. I open the fridge to find bottles of soda and ketchup and hot sauce and mayonnaise and bread and eggs and too many plastic, plastic containers. In the freezer are boxes of pizza and waffles and frozen meat wrapped in plastic. My stomach is so empty it's touching my back now. I grab a slice of orange cheese wrapped in plastic. I jump as Pre comes into the kitchen. She's changed into what looks like her sleep clothes, a too big t-shirt and sweatpants. Come upstairs, Fabiola, she says, motioning for me to follow her. She's holding my mother's carry-on that I'd left by the front door. Big day tomorrow, high school in America. I hope you've been practicing your mean mug in case you run up into some east side girls. And make sure you look them dead in the eye because you rep in the west side now. Don't show weakness, I'd cuz. My stomach twists at the thought of one more new experience. As I follow her, I stuff the slice of cheese into my mouth, and I can't believe that this is the very first thing I eat in America. It tastes like a mix of glue, chalk, and salt. Chantal greets me at the top of the stairs as Pre sets down the bag and goes into a small bedroom. Three doors line a narrow hallway, and Chantal points to one of them. We're sharing a room. I don't mind. 
She motions toward Pree's closed door with a poster of a crown and scepter crossing each other. That's the twins' room. She points to another closed door. And that's the bathroom. Now listen. She turns to face me. Her glasses are at the tip of her nose, and she looks up at me over the rim. You got to be really smart and fast about how you use this bathroom, okay? I nod. Donna's in there now, and if you got to pee and she's putting on her makeup or her wigs or whatever, you have to move to plan B. She locks the door and takes hours with her fake face and her fake hair. Ma probably won't let you lose, use her bathroom downstairs. She used to beat our asses for fighting over the bathroom, and she banned us from using hers, especially after she got that jacuzzi put in. Have you ever been in a jacuzzi? I scanned my memory for the English word jacuzzi. Wait a minute. In Haiti, were you using a bathroom that's inside the house or outside the house? I bite my lip, trying to figure out which story to tell her. Both, depending on whether or not there was electricity, I say. It's complicated. Complicated? What's so complicated about toilets? That's a basic necessity. Ma told us how she grew up squatting over the, what do you call those? Latrines. Yeah, the latrines were always in the back of the house. You mean to tell me y'all still have latrines? A loud bang comes from Pri and Donna's bedroom and makes us jump. Would you two please stop talking about shit? That's nasty. I'm trying to sleep, Pri yells from behind the closed door. Chantal steps over and bangs back. We're not talking about shit. We're talking about basic human necessities. Donna pokes her head out from the bathroom. You know what's nasty, Pri? She shouts. Not washing your ass before you go to sleep, smelling like a tuna sandwich. Don't stink up my room with your tuna sandwich ass. She shuts the door. Ay, 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 Matanjo's powerful voice booms up the stairs. Watch your mouths. You have a guest. Go to bed. Everything quiets for a short moment. Then Chantel laughs. Look at your face. You're probably like, what did I just walk into? I smile a little as she leads me to her bedroom. It's warm and neat like Chantal. When she turns on the light, the first thing to greet me are the shelves and shelves of books and more books. I want to stop and hug her and give her a big kiss on the cheek. With this many books, I can make this place my home. I set my mother's carry-on bag down on the soft beige carpet. An air mattress lies on the floor next to her neatly made bed, which is covered with a purple blanket and too many pillows. I wonder if my mother would have slept with her sister downstairs and think about where she's sleeping instead tonight. Donna comes out of the bathroom and stands in Chantal's doorway. She's still dressed, and it looks as if she's put on even more makeup. Donna, really? You're going out now? Chantal asks, says. Just for like a couple of hours, driving around, that's all. That's not true, Donna. He's taking you all the way out to Belle Isle, isn't he? No, we're just driving around. Maybe get something to eat at, Con at a Coney Island. That's all. Donna, please, don't get in Dre's car while he's racing, Chantal says. I unzip one of my suitcases and pretend not to listen, but I can't help wonder who this Dre is. Chantal is almost begging Donna not to go out. Dre's not going to be racing, Donna promises, and he don't like me in his car when he does anyway. He says I give him bad luck. Chantal presses her hands to her forehead as if to say that Donna is not using her head. And you don't see that as disrespectful? He's your man, but he thinks you give him bad luck? Whatever, Donna, you already made up your mind, but I'm sick of this shit. Donna doesn't say anything, but I can see hurt flash across her face like a strike of lightning. It's gone in an instant, hidden behind her layers of makeup and hair. The bedroom door closes, and I can barely hear her footsteps going down the stairs. The sound of a car's engine filters in through the window. You won't be sneaking out of the house to meet up with your shitty boyfriend, right? Chantal asks. I turn to her, wide-eyed. I don't have a boyfriend. I didn't think so. And don't get caught up in Donna and her boyfriend's shit, because he will try to holler at you. He ain't shit. She, she is talking to me and not talking to me at the same time. I only listen and don't give her any response. As she climbs into bed, I open the suitcase with my mother's clothes. I pull out one of her nightgowns to wear. Hopefully, this little bit of connection will help ease her through to this side. Hey, Chantal says from her bed. I'm sorry about your mom. I wish she was here, too. Mom was saying how she was going to be cooking and cracking jokes. Don't worry. We'll figure everything out. I hold on to the hope in her words. As Chantal turns off the light, I crawl onto the air mattress. It feels like clouds beneath my body. I pray for sleep to come soon, for Maman on the other side, and for Donna, who is racing out into the night with her boyfriend. At 1.30 in the morning, my eyes are burning and my stomach cries from hunger. I have not slept well since Thursday. This past week, my friends threw me a big party in our school's yard. It had been too late for us to return home, so we all spent the night sleeping on the hard concrete classroom floors. We had so much fun joking and giggling. 
The next few days were spent packing and giving away extra clothes and saying no to everyone who asked me to squeeze this or that into my suitcase for a loved one in Miami or Boston or New York. We made jokes about how to pronounce Detroit, Detroit, two, three, and Michigan rhymes with Leogan, the town, Michigan, except Americans don't say it that way. In the dark, I practice whispering Detroit and trying to get my mouth to wrap around the word just right. Quietly, I slide off the air mattress. I need to light a candle for my mother so she can find her way back to me, but I realize I don't have matches in my bag. I tiptoe down the dark stairs to search for some. A small light bulb is plugged into a socket in the kitchen. The green numbers on the stove say it's now two in the morning. I open all the drawers until I find a lighter instead, pocketing it in my mother's nightgown. A man's voice slices through the darkness. He's singing. He's singing. It's coming from outside. I move to the living room window and I can hear the words to his song, something about dancing in the streets. It's an old catchy tune like an American commercial. I tug apart the heavy curtains. Again, the singing. Louder now, more joyful. Across the street, a single lamppost shines on an empty weed infested lot. Sitting on what looks like an overturned plastic bucket is an old man with a hat. He throws his head back and sings the last verse to his song. Welcome to the D, city of the dead. Welcome to the D. Oh, don't let those hungry ghosts wake your little sleepy head. He finishes out his tune with a low guttural hum, just as the deep pounding bass of a revved car engine overrides his voice. A white car zooms around the corner and comes to a screeching stop right in front of the house. The singing man stands up from his bucket and braces himself to sing the chorus as loud as he can. Welcome to the D. Better pack your lead. Welcome to the D. Oh, don't let that greedy dope boy get all up in your head. At that same moment, a man comes out of the driver's side and takes long, deliberate steps toward the corner. Shut the fuck up, bad leg, the man shouts loud and crisp. He reaches the singing man, grabs the collar of the old man's dirty coat, and punches him until his body is limp. The punching man lets go, and bad leg falls to the ground, his body like an empty potato sack. Mind your own fucking business, old man, the punching man shouts. He kicks him one last time before returning to the car with his fists still clenched. I can't see his face in the dim streetlight. I shrink away from the window. I want to unsee and unhear everything. My heart is racing, and there's not enough air where I'm standing. Bad leg is still on the ground, rolling from side to side. I've seen this before. Old people in Delma who see and say too much are often beaten up or killed by young vagabond who have no respect for elders, for life, or for themselves. A second man comes out from the backseat of the car, younger, slim, and wearing a blue cap. Yo, Dre, chill. He runs to bad leg to help him up. The punching man, Dre, calls out to his friend. Yo, get the fuck away from him. But the blue cat man ignores Dre and tries to help bad leg to his feet. He reaches down to pick up the cane, hands it to him, and makes sure the old man is stable before walking back to the car. At the same moment, the passenger side door opens, and I recognize those boots and that long coat. Donna stumbles out. Her long hair hangs over her face, and she can barely stand up straight. She takes several clumsy steps toward the house, and I quickly close the curtains. I let the dark living room be my hiding place as the front door unlocks, and Donna steps in, removes her boots, and slowly makes her way up the stairs, leaving the strong scent of alcohol behind her. Her bedroom door lightly clicks shut. I wait a few minutes before I come out of my hiding place. I replay everything until it blurs into a dream. I want to tell my mom what I just saw and tell her that we have to go back. This corner where Matanjo lives is no different from some of the streets in Delma. I need to light her candles and hope that I can reach her. Upstairs, I find a near empty shelf in Chantal's room, move the books aside, and start taking my mother's things out of her carry on bag. A small statue of La Sainte Vierge two tea candles, the beaded a song gourd, a small brass bell, a white enamel mug, a cross, and a piece of white fabric. I bring the cloth up to my face and inhale the fragrance. I washed it by hand and soaked it in Florida water before we left. It smells of Maman's magic, our loas, our songs, our prayers. I move the magic things aside to dust off the shelf with my hand. I place the cloth down first, the cross in the center, then the other items around it. I add water from the bathroom sink into the mug. I'm now only missing a potted plant for the libation. I light a candle. It hisses in the dark. Chantal turns over, but a pillow covers her face.
I call my spirit guides to bend the time and space between where I'm standing and wherever my mother is. Maybe everything is happening for a reason. Maybe this was the wrong thing to do. Maybe we should go back. What would Maman say? I need to know. Share Maman. For all my life, you've taught me so much about how there is power and magic in our loas, in our songs, and in our prayers. Now, for the first time in my life, I get to test the truth of your words. This is the first night I've spent away from you, and I can't even conjure an image in my mind of where you must be. Remember that trip to Jack Mel last year when we stayed at a friend's house and you insisted that we share a mattress made for a crib? You pulled me in close and reminded me that even with my almost woman body, I am still your one and only baby. Both our feet hung off the edge of the mattress and touched the cool concrete floor, and we prayed that a little mouse or a big spider would not eat our toes. I'm sleeping on an air mattress now, and there's plush beige carpeting underneath. When I stared into the tiny flickering flame of the tea candle tonight, an image of you and where you are finally surfaced in my mind. You told me to trust every vision, every tingling of my skin, every ringing in my ear, every itch in my palms. They're all signs. They're all the language of the Lawas. But I've heard no whispers since the moment you were pulled away from me. How could the Lawas not have given us a sign that this would happen, Mama? Were we too blinded and distracted by the excitement? This vision of you now is the only thing I have to hold. I can see you. You're on a bed on top of another bed. And a thin layer of itchy fabric is barely enough to cover your body. It's your first night, but you've made some friends, two men and one woman. They are black, black like you. Black as if they've sat in the hot midday sun for most of their lives selling any and everything they could find just to make enough money to buy a plane ticket out of that hot sun. They're from Senegal, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire because they speak a broken French just like you. But Tante Jo doesn't let me speak French or Creole. When you come to this side, Mama, we will speak nothing but Creole. It will help me hold on to a piece of home. Kembe femme, Mama, hold tight, Fabiola.